Hello and welcome to the unofficial Unreal Engine podcast where we talk about all things Unreal Engine and also teeth that feel nothing. We're your hosts. My name's Alex. And next to me, <laughs> returning from a long stint of journeys is... Yes, uh, Jacob. Well, I, I'm yeah. happy to be back here chatting with you. We've got a lot to talk about uh, since... We, we haven't spoken since 2023. Yes. Yeah, it's been a month. There's plenty to, to catch up on. How how was your holidays and how's everything been for you in 2024 so far, Jacob? Well, it's it's been busy. But before I answer your question, I got to say, if you, if, you know, for those who are listening, who have listened, even up till now, look, if you made it one minute in, all right, consider <laughs> liking, subscribing, rating, whatever it is, wherever you're at. We really appreciate it. But to get to your point, <laughs> uh, I, I had a, a wonderful holiday, mostly relaxing, uh, and then it was right back uh, into the thick of it. I, I just got back from Seattle this last week. Um, it was my first time in Seattle, actually. I'm jealous. I've always wanted to go to Seattle. Haven't been there yet. Yeah, Tell it, me about it. I, I, my, my initial impressions are, one, I think the Space Needle is a hoax because... <laughs> I was there for three days. I went downtown. You know, I, I got around a little bit. Didn't see a Space Needle once. So I think that's just fake. Straight up. Um, <laughs> that's like the, they put it on the postcard so people show up. Uh, oh, that's right. And then the second one is that if you go down to the, the, the like fish market where supposedly they throw fish, I didn't see a single fish thrown. Okay. <laughs> so overall, huge you know, disappointment. Really losing points for me for that but otherwise uh it's it's a cool place i mean went to this is a little cliche and for, for the coffee snobs out there they might be a little insulted but i went to the the first starbucks in in uh in seattle uh and it, it was quite fun it was it was one of the reserves you know it, it wasn't too crazy but it was a good time and we walked out of there totally buzzed and then ran around seattle for an hour and uh, enjoyed ourselves thoroughly so um yeah overall pretty good pretty rainy weather was crazy and uh now i'm back and 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 ready to chat about some of the the very fun stuff that happened while i was gone yeah cool um big thing for me this month was uh january 2nd like right as my kids were going back to school i had to run over to jfk to uh fly out to phoenix arizona and then head to the arizona state university campus for a very cool event called Worlds in Play, uh, which I was frankly like a little bitter about at the beginning, like my friend Scarlett Kim and Jacob uh, uh, Penroser, I think, Penhol Penholster <laughs> were hosting. And uh, it was this inaugural event that's supposed to be like this big merging of people from games and theater and tech and XR and all that. But it was like, man, this is too early in the year. Like, I don't want to think. And then the event wasn't just like this passive, like, let's sit down and listen to some cool people talk. It was all like super interactive. Like you are building things and making things and participating in LARPs and, you know, <laughs> all these things that were like very, very active. I did like a Lego building session and uh, cool. invented a game about like bringing up memories with decks of cards where every card you play is a different year in your life. Uh, and, and you share all these things. And then that evolved into a way to like create new characters and new worlds in a fantasy setting. Uh, but suffice to say, I was very happy by the end of it that I went and it was just an incredibly invigorating, creative way to uh, start off the new year. And I, I feel like I got to spend a lot of time convincing people that Unreal Engine in particular is not that intimidating and they are brilliant, creative people who should not be too afraid of this kind of new technology. And I hope I got a few of them excited about the ways they could start to implement all of their awesome ideas using the latest digital tools. Yeah, very cool. That, I mean, that sounds uh, actually quite productive. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. And I, I hope they do it again. So if anyone wants to uh, keep tabs on that event, it was called Worlds in Play. And uh, I hope it happens every year, forever and ever. Yeah, pretty cool. So what have you, uh, what was your holiday like? You, you have a good holiday, uh, Alex? Yeah, I thought it was going to be a little more relaxing. Um, the holidays are usually when I'm like really busy in the thick of things during the year. And I'm like, oh, I wish I could just like relax and play a video game. Yeah. You know, very complicated thing to arrange. Um, I'm usually telling myself like, December, December over the holiday break, like I'll yeah. sit down and like box out, you know, six hours or whatever to play a video game. And that didn't really happen. Um, I was working hard to find time to play some video games. And I ended up playing probably the most um, Death Stranding like and things. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, both of which have been sitting in my Steam library for a very long time. 
And, uh, you know, I made I made some progress and they both kind of clicked with me in a way that they didn't when I first started playing them. Um, but I definitely wouldn't say I had a, a relaxing holiday. It was very busy jumping around a family in New Hampshire and Vermont. And then there were still like other projects that were ongoing because Christmas Carol took up so much time that yeah. I had neglected other things. And, you know, then there's just things like I have a bunch of receipts from trips and stuff like that going back to Unreal Fest in October that need to be like figured out. Sure. Um, yeah, so there season. was, you know, a, a lot of things bouncing around. Oh, also <laughs> very complicated on um, Christmas Eve. My wife and I actually took on the, I, I should say, surprisingly uh, complicated task. We should have known this would be complicated to give our, our youngest son his own bedroom because both our kids have been sharing a bedroom their whole lives. And they're like starting to butt heads more. And we're like, we should, you know, we can go live in a different part of the house and give our bedroom to our, our youngest son. And so while he was sleeping, we like tried to like move everything into this other room, move all of our other stuff out, um, give him like fresh sheets and, you know, make it all Christmassy. And it was uh, fun. But then it was like 4 a.m. in the morning. And it's like, we need to go to bed. <laughs> so that was that was a, a trip. Did you pull it off, though? Like uh... we did. Nice. Yeah. yeah. He got to wake up in his new room and be like, did Santa give me a new bedroom? It's like, no, no, no. We we did that. <laughs> Let's be clear about who put in all that. <laughs> Good, yeah. Santa, Santa wasn't rearranging the furniture. Yeah, that's probably for the best, honestly. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, OK. Like, what do you what do you want to jump into here, Alex? We, we got some big topics today. Yeah, I, I got a, a little list of a few things. I mean, we can dive into like, you know, the more bureaucratic things like the ongoing lawsuits with um, yeah. Epic uh, and Google and Apple and all that stuff. Um, we can jump a little bit more into like the Apple Vision Pro, which I know we've both been spending a lot of time thinking about. Uh, there's some fun events I want to draw some people's attention to. And um, yeah, and just some other cool things that it's like, hey, I'm glad these things are happening and that the dev community is, is always up to uh, the neat things that they do. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Right. Cool. Well, be behind me is um, a video uh, from the Apple Vision Pro launch that I thought was particularly interesting. Uh, Jacob, I'll, I'll announce for everyone that you said you started watching it and you found it very cringe, but maybe there might be some benefit in us kind of going through this together and, and kind of breaking down yep. um, what they're doing, because I found it fascinating. Uh, and why don't why don't before I say too much, why don't we just dive in and we're just going to kind of talk over it as it plays. If anyone hasn't seen this video, this is kind of Apple's introduction to the Apple Vision Pro and trying to get people who have never put on uh, this headset before, which right now is ninety nine point nine percent of the population, a sense of what it is um, actually. Like. Yeah, and, and we'll link this in the comments or sorry, the description on YouTube if you need a link to find it. So behind us right now is a, a video that's a bit of a guided tour for the Apple Vision Pro. And I thought it might be kind of interesting for us to walk through this. This is a recent video that Apple just released. Jacob, I know you said you thought it was a little bit cringe. I thought there's a lot of fascinating stuff going on in here. So maybe we just kind of talk through it as it plays and uh, we'll we'll maybe say something insightful. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? We could have a, a good thought. Um, we might have a good thought. We'll find out. <laughs> All yeah. right. And uh, we'll have the link below for anyone who wants to check this out themselves. So what we have is a, a product manager who's here to tell you about the Apple Vision Pro. We have a nice hero shot of it on a coffee table. And in theory, she's going to show it to a person who's never tried this headset before. Jacob, do you think this is actually someone who's never tried it before or a fairly skilled actor? Uh, it, you know, honestly, it could be both, um, <laughs> but probably just a skilled actor. I don't yeah, think they're legally think? liable if it, if that statement is is false. Uh, yeah, that's funny. So what I think is kind of interesting here is they are showing uh, his view quite a bit. And they're showing the fact that um, as he goes through this, he has certain instincts for how he wants to engage with it. And I like the fact that it's not perfect. There are certain times when he does things in a slightly unexpected way. And she corrects him. And I, I like that because it is the kind of way that this might actually happen in a real demo. So he's like finding where the buttons are. So he's figuring out how to press kind of the home button, which is this little crown, which is a lot like the crown you have on the Apple Watch. Um, you see the apps that are playing here. Um, oh, my feed froze. That's OK. <laughs> and you see the fact that he is uh, trying to express like how it feels to be in the headset. Now, of course, we keep cutting to what he's actually seeing. 
But I like the fact that unlike what Magic Leap got into trouble with because of the fact that they were showing a big immersive AR experience when it was actually very small, this is actually very, very close to what it will feel like for people in the headset because of the fact that it is really a VR headset that has you know very right. good pass through uh, that people are going to be able to look through and and feel very much what is going on here. So the way he's pinching, oh, and here, this is a key moment. I want to pause here for just a second yep, yep. because he reaches up to do a pinch to make the screen bigger. And what does she say, Jacob? She says, you don't have to keep your hands in the air. You can put them. Yeah, she you says you down. can rest them comfortably in your lap. This is the main moment that I was like, aha, they're doing something really useful here because they could just show him doing all the things correct. But this is a really common thing people are going to do because for anyone who has seen Minority Report or any kind of sci-fi movie with, you know, hand gestures, what are people always doing, Jacob? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're always waving them around and poking in the air. And yeah, I but in, in honesty, that is how most AR devices, at least, have operated. Uh, That's right. Until now. Uh, so, yeah, if you're going to use a MetaQuest Pro with hand tracking, you got to do it like that. Um, HoloLens has you doing everything like way out in front of you. And, you know, it's actually a little exhausting to do that, like three minutes of just holding your arm out to like do gesture things. And you're like, I just want to sit down and do a mouse. So there is something kind of fascinating about the fact that um, they are are really pushing for this kind of put your hands in your lap and just relax kind of modality because your eyes are the cursor and that's what's actually going to uh, guide the things that you're clicking on. Like really all your finger is doing is it's like the mouse clicker, but the mouse itself is your eyes. So, you know, she tells him to rest your hands comfortably in your lap and then we'll kind of continue from here. And so then he's like, oh, OK, and now he gets it. And he's still pinching and zooming and really just translating, I think, in a fairly intuitive way, the ways he would interact with an iPhone or an iPad um, in a way that I think is frankly better than what, you know, Meta has done to try to explain their headset. The best video of this I saw um, back in 2016 was actually done by HTC and Valve when they brought like a family into kind of like a green screen studio and let them play with uh, the lab, that early demo that came out with the HTC Vive. And again, you're seeing these really organic interactions between uh, regular people trying this out for the first time. And if you're a fairly empathetic human, you're watching the joy and the fun that they're having, and it helps you better understand how it would feel to be doing that yourself. Yeah. Because the trickiest thing about any kind of VR, AR, XR, spatial computing is really making people understand what it feels like. So cutting back and forth between his reactions and the product manager here explaining and his desire to get up and walk around. Um, you can see the battery pack is in his pocket while he's doing this. It's really, I think, doing a nice job of making you feel what it's like to be in device in a very real way. Yeah, I, Nothing about here is conceptual. I want to point out also that the, the examples they're giving here are not flashy. You know, like they're not. No, not at all. They're not jumping into anything that is you know, uh, uh, like a killer app or an, no, this is just photos, right? Because I, I think they understand that probably the first thing someone's going to do is look at just the default apps on their device and they're mm -hmm. going to form an initial impression very quickly based on that. The other thing to consider is like they're going to have these in Apple stores and, and there was mm -hmm. some information that came out about what that process would look like. I don't know if you saw this, Alex. Um, about like what the in-store experience was going to be. Uh, no. But um, yeah, the, the, it's just worth pointing out that this is, they haven't started with anything flashy yet. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they went from like, you know, all those panoramas you've taken, like you're now going to be able to look at those more immersively. And then they're showing spatial video, which I think is harder to get across the sense of here. I really look forward to talking more about spatial video um, once I'm allowed to and, and have the headset on February 2nd. But even little things like this, where it's like I'm watching Apple TV and I am making the screen bigger and dimming the lights around me um, just to make it feel more like you're in a movie theater and more immersive. These are really simple, low hanging fruit you know, simple cognitive ladder kind of stuff that is not complicated for a regular person to understand. So, you know, all the the crazier things that are possible with XR and the Vision Pro and all that, that can come later. But as an introduction to this, this new world, as it will be for most people, um, I think this is very straightforward, very clean, very easy to understand. I sent this to like yeah. my dad and my mom and my grandmother and like they can understand what's going on here. I want to, um, I want to point out real iPhones. quick, Alex, yeah. just because it's on the screen. When yes. they came to this table they're sitting at now, he sat down wearing the headset, right? He, 
yeah. implying that he didn't have to take it off when moving between spaces. He didn't have to recalibrate it. He he just moved, right? Which is also seems pretty risky because most device manufacturers would say, oh, well, now it's a liability. We don't recommend you wear this while, you know, in motion. But I, I guess they're kind of implying that you can keep this thing on or that, like, that's the intention. So I, I just think that's an interesting signal that they gave us there. Yeah, there is a bit of a deviation here because in the previous videos and I think even like their press releases, it was like, this is meant to be a seated experience. You are on the couch. You've got the battery pack resting next to you and it's all meant to be like done from a couch. And here we actually do see him getting up, walking around, moving between spaces, leaving the headset on and starting to pull up apps. You'll notice he's doing the apps at different places in the room too. He's not doing them all from the same place. So there's also the potential of persistence here where you might pin certain apps. Yeah. So, you know, whenever you're doing a FaceTime call, it's always from like this perspective. I also, now, sorry, yeah. I, this is a quick thing is, I love like the, the target audience apartment they're in which is like probably a three million dollar apartment in san francisco <laughs> but yeah, yeah yeah sorry as you were the biggest problem with all things <laughs> ar and mixed reality is if you want to share what you're doing in it it's like oh man i gotta clean my living room yeah. like what a what a nightmare <laughs> uh, whereas vr it's like it's whatever's the virtual thing yeah. now this part to me did feel a little bit uncanny valley so we are seeing a persona right now he's talking to someone where this isn't actually a video of her this is her avatar and it looks pretty good, but there's just something about the eyes, something about the way the mouth's moving yep. that to me isn't quite there yet. Um, also, it's interesting they didn't take the opportunity to show his persona. We know he has one because we're seeing his eyes, but I thought they might might have shown a bit of a cut back and forth between the woman who he's talking to, his persona, and his. Yeah. But um, I, I think they're worried that when you see a persona next to the actual person, you'll be like, ah, eh, it doesn't quite match them as much. Um, we'll see. Yeah. By the way, I heard some rumors that Meta is really pushing on the codec avatars uh, to get them out really fast, probably to compete with Persona. This is a cool moment where because the Apple Vision Pro is aware of where people are, they want to make it feel like you can be immersed in something but still carry on a conversation so people can fade into view from the digital content that you're in and you have the ability to turn up and down the you know immersiveness, how much of the virtual world versus how yeah. much of the real world you see. But I still don't know how natural it's going to be to be feel to be carrying on a conversation with someone in the headset, yeah. but I like the effort they're but making. This is one of the things that I, I and we can get more into this because this is a deeper conversation after we're done with the video here, but Thinking about how Apple's peripherals fit into all, all this, like I, I always assumed Apple Watch would have a haptic or some some sort of, you know, uh, a part in this. I recently got uh, new AirPods, and they have the adaptive audio where if someone starts talking to you or you start talking to someone, it fades out the noise cancellation. This is a very similar angle where I could see these two things working really well together in the future. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think th there's going to be a lot of connective connectiveness between this, like they've already talked about using AirDrop and things like that between these devices. But I would love my Apple Watch to like vibrate whenever I do a pinch gesture. Exactly. I might <laughs> want one on each hand, which would be kind of weird, like two Apple Watches. Uh, I hear people talking about rings all the time and having like haptic rings as a really useful peripheral for this. Um, so, you know, I everyone has to remember this is the very first version of this. Uh, by the way, someone told me, and I, they didn't substantiate why they thought this, but they told me this Encounter Dinosaurs app uh, was made in Unreal Engine. And if that's true, then there's something weird going on. Yeah, but yeah. I just assumed it was made in Unity or something like that. Yeah. So Or Reality. Well, this is like it's one of the most reality. classic VR demos. I, I mean, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, the Oculus version of this that came with the Oculus CV1 in Dream Deck, whenever I'd give someone this demo where a T-Rex like leans down and roars at you and he like kind of spits at you, I'd like throw a little bit of water at people and they'd be like, what the heck? <laughs> uh, it's a great way to just add a little extra immersion. But yeah, it's you know great to see something come out of a frame and be right there with you. Uh, but you'll notice like that's really the only 3D content that they're showing. Everything else yeah. is like a flat screen that is just in your space. So they're keeping it really simple, really straightforward here. We're not seeing games. Um, you know, there's there is some stuff that I know is coming with Apple TV that I saw myself that I can't talk about. That is like more interesting 3D content. But the way that they are just trying to make this uh, friendly and accessible and not seem like a, a crazy exactly. new paradigm that only tech geeks are going to like is pretty fascinating. I remember this being your your initial impression is that 
they're go- you know uh with the original announcement even they were going after kind of the core device use cases they they wanted to kind of introduce people to vr with things that are familiar with familiar to them and i think yeah, yeah this is just a continuation of that so looking at photos and watching a movie you know i I, and that is really where apple is differing in this market compared to meta and everyone else who honestly maybe believe more and like uh uh, or openly believe more in this kind of like grand vision for ar and vr Mm -hmm. um and so they try to sell you on their vision for the future of immersive media Versus Apple mm-hmm. that doesn't isn't trying to sell you on that. They're trying to sell you on, hey, you might like looking at your photos on this device, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. you you might like watching a movie on it, like uh, FaceTiming, you know, all, all things that are super relatable. So yeah, I, I think that's that's super core to what they're doing here. Yeah, and again, like Meta never really found great integration with the Google Play Store, so it never you never felt like you had that easy of a leap going from like, yeah, I know how to use my uh, Pixel phone, and now I'm going to do something similar on yep. Meta. It always felt like a very different um, operating system. Um, one thing I wanted to show real quick too is um, I got like a little hole going at the moment. Um, let's see if you can see that okay on the TV screen in the center. TV screen in the center. Maybe not. Maybe yes. Maybe not. Maybe yes. <laughs> there we go. Um, we'll go full screen with this for a second. So moving over into, you know, why are Alex and Jacob talking about the Apple Vision Pro in the Unreal Engine podcast? Um, a lot of people are wondering about, you know, Apple Vision Pro support for uh, Unreal Engine. Uh, I think we've talked in a previous episode about Victor Broden's kind of official statement of like, yes, we're working on something, uh, but also we're doing the same kind of things that anyone else can do, kind of building on the SDK. But I did want to start to query the community a little bit for, you know, how important this stuff is for them. So for our audio only listeners, I just started this poll a little while ago, um, but I have for the UE5 devs, how important to you is Apple Vision Pro support? And at the moment, we have 38.2% saying, please, as soon as possible. 17.4% saying later this year is fine. 22.2% both saying whenever, no rush, and I don't care at all. So, you know, more than 50% are like this year, you know, let's get this going uh, with the winner so far being please as soon as possible. Uh, Above that, I've got another little thing that says when Apple Vision Pro is fully supported for Unreal Engine 5, how important is it to you that Epic provides learning content on it? And I ask this one specifically because of the layoffs um, that Epic had that affected a lot of the education team. A lot of departments like the um, online learning portal and whatnot were pretty gutted. So, you know, by default, uh, we can't assume that there's going to be anything beyond some basic documentation for using the Apple Vision Pro. And of course, we'll have great YouTubers who go and, and show how to do stuff on it. But I, I did want to kind of see how uh, much, you know, it's going to be important to the community that there is actually first party documentation, kind of the way that Unreal Engine's done a great job um, explaining metahumans. I say that knowing that a lot of people get frustrated when things change from 5.1 to 5.2 to 5.3 and there isn't uh, necessarily new videos or new uh, updates on that. But um, this is the kind of thing where like, I might try to show Epic at some point, like, hey, did an informal poll, just maybe this is useful that, you know, 250 people voted and and here's kind of where they land on this issue. Um, because people have been saying, Alex, have you gotten the Apple Vision Pro to work on uh, the headset. I can't talk about what I did at the actual developer day, but I can talk about uh, what I did before the developer day, which is the same thing anyone else could do, which is to use the simulator. And the simulator by all accounts is a really good um, representation of exactly um, what would happen on device. I think my my screen share is starting to slow down my frame rate, so I'm just gonna remove it for a second. So. The way I got it to work on the simulator was in Unreal Engine 5.4, which you can get from the GitHub. That has Apple Vision Pro uh, as a uh, supported platform. Now it says supported platform, but it's not really out of the box. A few of the things that I had to do to make it work, um, and this isn't really meant to be a guide because I did a lot of janky things that didn't work, didn't work, didn't work. And even the thing that I did that ultimately worked hasn't worked for me lately. So this is like active development, but um, I enabled a plugin with the VR template that's in there called, um, I think it's like Apple Vision Pro OpenXR support or something like that. 
um, or the OpenXR Vision OS plugin. It's something like that that you can find. So I enabled that um, in the project settings. I hit the checkbox to support A8. I hit the checkbox for iOS simulator support. Um, and then I didn't package directly from the editor. I actually did like a build cook run from the command line and eventually was able to get like an Xcode project that I was able to open up in Xcode using one of the betas of the uh, Vision Pro simulator. And then I was able to launch that in the Vision Pro simulator and move around in what's basically the VR template. So, you know, that's fully immersive mode. There's no mixed reality in there. But like it did make me feel like, OK, there is a workflow that's developing for getting epic content to there. Um, and hopefully I'll be allowed to say relatively soon what happened when I took what I'd done with the simulator and tried it on the device. But, you know, rest assured, I know a lot of people are frustrated by Unity putting all of their Apple Vision Pro support behind a, a paywall with Unity Pro. And some people are very intimidated by getting started with Swift and Reality Kit. Um, WebXR, I think, is an interesting place to be looking at, too, since we know that's supported with Safari. But Unreal Engine, you know, a lot of us have really cool Unreal Engine projects we'd love to show people in the Apple Vision Pro. Um, and I, I hope that that becomes a, a reasonable thing sooner rather than later. So you mentioned there's not much you can talk about, but I've been seeing all sorts of folks talking about their impressions of the device. You're not allowed to mm -hmm. give any of that. I think I, I, I don't want to speculate too much on like why we were told, you know, not to talk about our experience, but I would speculate that it has something to do with the developer nature of what we were seeing. It wasn't necessarily as controlled as what uh, the press was guided through. So I think everything that the, happened with the press was like very curated and very like, you know, you can talk about this because we know exactly what you were shown. Um, whereas as one would expect with a developer day, you know, we had we had a full day. We had seven hours to kind of use the device however we wanted. So I, I hope at some point Epic's like, yeah, or Epic. Um, I hope Apple at some point is like, hey, yeah, go ahead. Talk about this as much as you want. But uh, I don't want to get <laughs> blackballed sure. from uh, being an Apple developer yet. So I'm going to try to play it safe. That's fair. Um, That's fair. One interesting thing. So mo in the most recent press tour where all the press was able to um, try the device for the final time before it's released, um, it was the first time we were able to see pictures of people in the headset. Yeah. Now, some of the journalists said something very interesting, which is like the way it looks is like, oh, we finally got to take pictures. And then like, you know, we were able to uh, uh, have a little more freedom with how we talked about the device. Not true. Apparently what happened was the Apple employees were the ones taking pictures and uh, they did it with their own devices. And then they airdropped to you the ones that they approved of. So I know some journalists were trying to do like silly things. Like they've got the headset on and their tongue is out or they're like, Bleh! <laughs> and like no one was able to use it. They just pictures. don't want they thumbnail. Weren't... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you notice almost all the, the press photos of uh, journalists in the headsets are all very like, ah, like almost stock photography of like, cool, I'm in the headset. It looks nice. And uh, not much beyond that. Interesting. Um, yeah. And Jacob, I haven't asked you yet. Are you going to get an Apple Vision Pro? <laughs> I, I actually did not pre-order one. Yeah. And, and there was a few reasons for this. Um, first, it's an expensive device. You know. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I think about $4,000 after taxes and everything. And look, I, given what they've showcased thus far, I don't see a feature on the device that I could not gain from a devices I currently own. Like yeah. I just upgraded, I just got a new TV, you know, I can watch movies. Uh, you know, I have a perfectly good, you know, Apple laptop. I got my mm -hmm. iPhone, I AirPod, you know, like, sure. If you want to make an argument that you can put it all together and it becomes something special, I, I have plenty of VR headsets. You know, yes, I, I I agree. Like you put those together and that becomes something interesting. And I'm definitely excited to try it. Like I I'm gonna I'm definitely gonna go to the Apple Store and try it. Don't get me wrong. And I, I know a few people who who, who have ordered it. For example, uh, uh, some of my coworkers, and I'm gonna be stealing it for a few hours <laughs> um but yeah it, it just didn't it didn't make sense i i, I don't think yeah yeah I, I would not have bought one for myself as a consumer um i did buy one on behalf of agile lens because we're going to use it as a, a developer tool and you know i think people forget that the first version of every apple product they would never use the term developer kit or, or anything like that but it is that you know there it's always 
a, a, a thing with a lot of potential that doesn't have an app ecosystem yet that hasn't had the stamp that developers put on all this stuff by building really cool apps. And it's something people are figuring out. Like the Apple Watch, I think, has evolved so much from what it was yep. during the first um, version of it to what it is now. And I think we're going to see something similar happen here. So a lot of people, I'm telling them, like, yeah, wait until there's a you know $1,200 version or something like that, like something that's more comparable to a phone. And kind of like you know the, the way a lot of people say, don't buy a video game on day one because you're paying the most for the least stable version of that experience because it's going to go on sale and it's going to have patches and all that. Similar kind of thing with hardware like this. Like by the time you get to Gen 2, Gen 3, Gen 4, it'll be cheaper. It'll be more integrated into uh, the other Apple ecosystem products. It's going to have a better sense of what it is, especially because there's going to be more apps for it. Yeah. So I don't, I wouldn't begrudge anyone who's like, yeah, I'm not ready to buy this yet. Yeah. I, the, the other thing that was honestly a bit of a nail in the coffin for me is just the battery life. Um, oh yeah. I'm very bad about charging devices in general. Like I, I'm just not good on keeping I, on top of it. Um, so like my Apple watch constantly is out of battery because, mm -hmm. and that has a full you know day of battery life and I forget yeah. to charge it. Like a lot of the VR, like both my quests are out of battery, right? Cause I just forget to charge them. Um, so like, I, I can't imagine spending that much money on it. Just knowing about myself that it's probably just going to sit dead for a long time you know, a, a long time until I want to watch something and then I have to like plug it into a wall and I look ridiculous or whatever. Right. <laughs> and once again, I'd probably rather just watch a movie on my TV. So like, yeah, that, that, that was also a bit of a deal killer. I, I, I was surprised that did not get more negative coverage. Mm. Um, yeah. You get a lot of people talking about the weight lately. Um, again, I'll talk about how I felt about the weight when I'm perfectly clear that I'm allowed to, but, um, battery concern also something for me i actually did buy an extra battery as you're yeah. checking out it asks you for you know any accessories you want it was 200 dollars for an extra full battery and i figured for our purposes that'll be worth it whether we're giving demos yeah. or um uh just developing also when you have it plugged into a computer it's you know running off the charge of the the macbook or whatever so that's pretty uh straightforward um I also just want to mention, by the way, huge props to Apple for making the checkout process super easy. Like, yeah. I assumed the reason why it only took me a minute and a half to go from like opening up the app right at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to checking out two and a half minutes later was because, oh, no, there's no demand for it. Uh, when, in fact, uh, it sounds like not only did they sell out the initial like 80,000 units they had, but they sold out for the next like couple batches that are coming in. So it's something yeah. like. 150,000 units that have sold. And so considering that, uh, the fact that the Apple App Store app remained very stable and uh, didn't give me any trouble at all, you know, yeah. I, that's kind of unprecedented. I've never experienced that with anything from concert tickets to a device uh, that goes yeah. on sale. But this you know, is like nothing compared to yeah. an iPhone, you know, release, right? Like, exactly. Yeah. I, yeah, you have to imagine they they've dealt with this a few times, and it, I I was just impressed to hear people's stories of, you know, it got guiding you through the 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 face measuring and yeah, just very clever and very thought out. And and this is I think the the, the biggest thing is that yeah, you could call it a dev kit if you kind of want to explain who will probably benefit the most from it. Like I do think developers. I, I asked Alex, like, hey, do you think I should get one? Um, and he right. said, if you plan on developing on it, yes, absolutely. If not, I don't know. Um, and yeah, I, I do think developers will get the most out of it. Um, but the experience is straight for the consumer, right? Like for, for everyone. And that video we just watched is not for developers. Like developers, no. you know, are going to break everything. They're going to immediately get in there and try to mess with things. Okay. How far can I tap? You know, like that's not for them. Um, <laughs> so that, I think that's the biggest difference in, in approach that someone like Apple takes is if they're going to try and convince people and the market that this is the next big consumer device, which is what they do, you know, they're taking a, what seems like a, a much more reasonable approach. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. I, I think Apple's going about this in a really smart way. And I say that not as someone who, you know, has been in XR for over 10 years now and very easily could have been like, they're not doing any cool things that no one else has done in XR before, because what they're doing is so centered around what Tim Cook said on launch day, which is we're so excited to show uh, people spatial computing for the first time. And a lot of us had an initial reaction to that, like there's been spatial computing for years now, but he really means like, we want this to be the first device that a lot of people try this out on. Yeah. And we want it to be a really smooth experience that they, you know, get excited about. So I, I again, I think what they're doing is really smart. Yeah. So, and you know, good job, Apple, I hope. And, and this is absolutely like a rising tide that raises all boats sort of situation, right, exactly. because just by Apple taking this seriously and being in the game, it makes anyone else, Meta, Vario, whoever, everyone else kind of like wake up and say like, oh man, we really got to get our shit together and uh, and make sure that we can compete properly with Apple because they're the giant behemoth elephant in the room. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I think this will overall be be very good for the ecosystem. I, I, yeah, I'm excited to see what sort of content we, we get. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's I, I I'm bummed, honestly, like I, I really did want to get one. Um, but uh, I, f I feel like I made a sound decision for now. Yeah, yeah, you shouldn't worry about it. Um, and of course, yeah, if your if your colleagues won't let you use theirs, you can come over to my office oh, anytime and use mine. Thank you. Alan. We'll try to be pretty generous. And I am curious how because obviously I got a medium device that was like sized for whatever it picked up from my face shave. And I am curious um, yeah. how many people will put it on and be like, something just looks off. To oh, actually, this is this is a question I have. And maybe you're not able to answer this, but mm. um, what happens if you put someone else's device on? Do their eyes show up on your face? I or like they, they said, <laughs> yeah, so I can't comment on this directly, but I thought Apple said something publicly about how like it was going to be locked to just you. And, and they uh, implied something like if you were going to put on someone else's device, you would just get like a, like an error or like a big X uh, or this something. This is like the retina but, uh, scanning stuff, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, something like that. But it's like they have to know that people want to demo this and try it out. You know, like I know my company is going to have at least a couple demos on this that we're going to want to bring to trade shows and yep. like let people look at the experience in, and there, there has to be a way to make sure that it's not going to get yeah. angry every time someone else puts the headset on. But I understand Apple wanting to control this and make sure that people are having a good experience. And they know, I'm sure that it's going to reflect poorly on them. If someone with a large head puts on a small device and it feels way too tight and the IPD is wrong. Yeah. And like, that's going to make them feel like Apple messed up. Not that they were, you know, wearing the wrong device. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, they have to be able to do, yeah, to do demos. I, I mean, otherwise, like, how are you yeah. going to convince your friend to buy one? You know, um, yeah. our our client for the uh, the Four Seasons project, he has one of these apps that will read your IPD, and every time someone's about to put the headset on, you know, he'll read do that really quick, get someone's IPD, set it up in the MetaQuest Pro, and make sure that they then are are seeing the correct um, eye distance once they're in device. Yeah, yeah the, I I also had some other questions about the eye thing, which maybe you can't answer, but like. So it's it's an avatar of some sort, they've said. A persona. <laughs> persona, right? So it's like some AI 3D scan, something or another, right? But what happens if, for like example, like the headset tilts? Like, is it tracking your face well enough to like move? Like, these are questions I have because that seems like the bare bottom, like meme worthy content that would come out of this. It's like as soon as people throw this on their face and their eyeballs are like twisted or like yeah. that's going to immediately, uh, you know, <laughs> cause issues. Um, so I, I have so or, or the questions. simple version, like, like people it, like Sony just revealed a new headset at CES. And one of the cool things that, you know, Windows Mixed Reality was doing a while ago is being able to flip it up. And for headsets yeah. that don't flip up, a lot of times developers will like just kind of bring it up over their forehead. So like, yeah, what happens to the lenticular screen when it just can't see your eyes? Yeah, That's a good question. It, it just it's I mean, the rumor was that they didn't have the feature ready um, at, the, yeah. at the launch. And that seems like a very <laughs> difficult feature to ship in a few months. Now, I, I'm sure it was obviously well in progress, but I wonder if it was like. Well, partially, I wonder if they needed to, like, get people to scan more their face more. Like, with this, like, launch, they probably just collected a few 
well, I guess 100,000 people's faces as part of the selling process. Like, I'm wondering if this is like going to be some last minute scramble, some like later software update. Like, you're going to get the device day one. It's going to have a big software update and they're going to improve. You know, I, I just, I have a lot of doubts about about the face, the, the eyes in the, in the headset. Uh, that's, that just seems ripe for, uh, yeah, ripe for destruction. Parody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Creepiness. By the way, did you see the, um, the new invention from, uh, one of the, the Disney inventors, this, uh, yeah. Yeah. Let me, I've, I've got that pulled up. Let me show that real quick for anyone. This was all over the place screen. this week. I, I, yeah, it's cool to see though. So yeah, Jacob, what did you hear about this? Well, I, I I'm very intrigued by how it could work. But I saw it all over the place. Um, there's been so many attempts at this sort of thing, uh, you know, movement for AR VR, and definitely this is the coolest. If I'm being perfectly honest, <laughs> but like I have so many questions. The first one being, what's underneath that? Right, right? Because he is in like a boxing ring, right? So he could have like three feet of like <laughs> of mechanical nonsense below this just to make the mm. tiles work. Um, my assumption is that the tiles are shifting under him and like reconfiguring or something or. The thing that I'm no. most concerned about is this seems great when you are in motion. But if you then plant your feet and stop, I feel like you're still going to drift a little bit. And that seems like the kind of thing that could make someone feel really sick yeah. in VR. I don't know. I, so you can kind of see it. It's like going in grids. And man, I it's really hard to see what it's doing. Like this could 100% be a troll. And we would never know. Uh, <laughs> Come on, Disney. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, the, this, though, like harkens back to the days of VR treadmills and all the nonsense that that the came virtuix out. Virtuix and all that. Yeah, the, yeah, but you know, again, if you're using something like Unreal Engine and you've got a hyper photorealistic scene, um, anything that starts to be more of an immersion multiplier is, is pretty great. Like I was joking, saying like, "Ah, oh, I think it's time to convert the the five thousand square foot holodeck in Austin to something that's like fifty square feet," uh, because if this does get to a point where you don't need as much physical space because this feels just like walking around a real space. Um, that's pretty exciting. But yeah, but it also we'll probably cost half a million it. dollars to build. You know, like <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah th th that's typically where these things go, right? Like, they're. I remember way before the VR uh, era, they had the the big hamster balls. You know, right? And it's like, yeah, it works, but like, who's putting a hamster ball <laughs> that's the size of a warehouse? You know, anywhere near their home or near an off? You know, like that's really the tends to be the issue with, with those sorts of things. Yeah. But good for that guy. Um, he seems very nice. Yeah. He seems like a super cool inventor <laughs> who has one of the most awesome jobs in the world, just like inventing things for Disney 100%. theme parks. Uh, it's like an Imagineer, but like another couple levels higher because it doesn't even need to be for a specific ride. He can just be yeah. like coming up with super cool ideas. He just he's um, has tenure, yeah. you know. It's like <laughs> yeah, yeah. It seems like he can stay there as long as he wants and just keep making cool stuff. Um, one thing I wanted to mention too, and I forgive me if I already mentioned this on a previous podcast, I was playing a little more of Asgard's Wrath 2 over the holiday, and what a beautiful looking standalone VR experience made in Unreal Engine. Um, putting this out there, I think it would be a really cool guest for us to talk to anyone on the development team who worked yeah. on that project, just to understand how they made it look so good um, on a standalone headset. That would be awesome. And I want to know what version of Unreal they're using and if every, all the lighting is baked and, you know, are they in deferred rendering or forward and, and all that kind of stuff. Cause it's at a level of fidelity that I've really only seen maybe with like red matter, but of course we know red matter and red matter two are using a heavily modified version of Unreal Engine. And I'm curious if that's the case here as well. Yeah. I, I've been hearing such great things about that, that game. Yeah. I, I haven't played it yet. I haven't played it yeah. yet. Also, I don't think, yeah, we, this happened while we were off. Um, did you see that the, the prey dog UEVR mod yeah. came out? Yeah. So I, I, I need to try that as well. I got like my, my list, uh, already. Cause yeah, that I want to try like some, some solid, like, uh, well, what, what's like 
what's the classics <laughs> that I I can load up in here? It's all Unreal Engine games, right? So like, yeah, I mean like Hogwarts Legacy is gonna yeah, look awesome oh, that's, flying around. That's a good one. Magical Kingdom. <laughs> like you like wave your wand in Hogwarts Legacy? Is that like? Yeah, well, so one thing that's kind of interesting, uh, an ongoing debate about using this, uh, let's see if I can show the TV again. Um, this is just the GitHub for it, is that uh, third person versus first person, because uh. there's a lot of ways you can modify um, a game to be from third person to, to first person, and it's probably going to look a little more natural. I was doing this a lot uh, back in like July with, um, you know, Jedi Survivor and like how cool it felt to be swinging a lightsaber around being much closer to it. Um, but third person, a tricky thing is like the way you naturally move a camera in third person is going to potentially make you feel kind of sick. So finding that balance between like, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm immersed in this world from this video game I love and making sure that the control scheme isn't a complete and utter mismatch for what you're doing uh, is tricky. Um, I had a great time playing It Takes Two with my kids, uh, with one of us in VR and we traded back and forth and one of us just using a regular controller, uh, all from the same computer. Um, that was really cool. So split screen things can can work really well with this. Um, but the other thing too is for all of our friends out there who are developing things in Unreal Engine, like go back and find some of your old projects it, because the idea is that it can be an Unreal Engine thing you made that was not made for VR and now it will run in VR. So I went and I, I looked at some of the very first Unreal Engine projects I ever made back in like 2016, 2017 and uh, ran this and was like, oh my God, VR version cool. of that now. So that that's really cool. I, I love the fact that this kind of breathes new life into older projects. Yeah, I, this is definitely something I have to try out. I wonder if yeah. you could play like, can you jump into like Borderlands? Because that's an Unreal Engine game too, right? Is Borderlands VR or uh, Unreal Engine? Uh, this is a great question. Um, on a similar note, it's probably worth mentioning uh, that... Yeah, Unreal, Unreal Engine 3. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I got excited there. Unreal Engine 3, yeah. Um, <laughs> then I don't think it will work. I think this is only for Unreal Engine 4 ah, and Unreal yeah. Engine 5. But um, I want to find uh, Amanda Watson, who invented Airlink and has helped us out with um, the work that we've been doing at Four Seasons. Uh, what is the GitHub... It's uh, it's it also in the same vein as this UEVR injector. Um, she took Citra, which is a um, example of, man, I just got to find the, the actual link now. She took Citra, which is a very popular Nintendo 3DS mod. Uh, and of course, Nintendo 3DS had like a flat screen that moved back and forth. Um, Amanda, just trying to find your GitHub. Um, and she took it and made a standalone version of it that works on quest so pretty cool now i found when i installed it that out of the box um it wasn't working fantastic i needed to go and mess with a bunch of the settings but i tried metal gear solid 3 and mario kart and um zelda cool. and uh, a bunch of these games that i i haven't played in a very long time you know since playing with uh, a 3ds and they look great you can like resize the screen make it much much bigger so uh, I thought that was also a really cool new port of something to VR. Uh, clearly not Unreal Engine. I, I am sure that none of the games made for 3DS were made in Unreal Engine, but uh, still another cool way of bringing older games to life. Although I think it's relevant to our Apple Vision Pro conversation because so much of what I think we're finding between Apple Vision Pro, uh, the UEVR Praydog mod, and this now with Citra VR is the fact that people are interested in... 3D content that isn't necessarily completely immersive. Um, you know, everyone thought that 3D TVs were a gimmick, that there wasn't anything really of value to them. But to just start to be like, you know what, it's okay to have VR 180 or like a frame that has 3D content, but there's still other things around you that are not in frames. Uh, there seems to be value in that. So it's, it's kind of fascinating to see this resurgence in interest in... I want to say limited 3D content rather than fully immersive VR content. Yeah, I mean, if you gave me the Apple Vision with multitasking in Mac OS mm -hmm. with a battery life that was similar to a MacBook, yeah, that would be a, a killer device, right? Like, Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and uh, one thing they showed in the video that we didn't comment on is how easy it is to take whatever you're doing on like a MacBook Pro and just kind of like bloop, now you're putting it in space and dragging it around. And similarly, like we haven't seen this yet, but I, I have to imagine it's gonna be a very short amount of time before you can take literally any app 
on your iPhone and kind of drag it up, like flick it up or something. And now it'll be in your space and it's immersive and you can move it around and resize it and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, easiest example to imagine that is photos. Like I want this photo, this photo, this photo, and you collage them around yeah. yourself, but also even just like, okay, I'm going to give a presentation and I'm going to practice some public speaking and I'm going to pull up this notes document and these slides or whatever. And I'm just going to have those things around me as I talk. Um, that's kind of fascinating. Then of course, I'm sure at some point we'll see someone like actually give a talk uh, while we're in an Apple Vision Pro where they're referencing all their notes and everything from inside the device. And that'll probably look pretty creepy and weird, but yeah. uh, we're going to see that. We're going to see the, the glass holes equivalent of people walking around in their Apple Vision Pros, uh, ordering coffee or speaking to their airline hostess. And uh, some people might think it looks really cool. And some, some people are going to be like, that guy's an asshole. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's always what happens with like these rich people toys. Yeah. 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 Um... <laughs> I'm just, I'm really so intrigued what's going to happen. I got to say, it's like, it, yeah, it, we're, it's we're definitely going to have an, another episode uh, probably soon where it's like, okay, I have the device. We've both tried it. We've, I've done some dev work, whatever. And then we can comment on like the actual lived experience of this thing instead of just the, the yeah. hype and the things that we are allowed to talk about. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Uh, let's talk briefly about the latest uh, lawsuit yeah. situation. Um, so one of the more ridiculous ones I know we, we both were responding to, Jacob, was Apple uh, being told basically like, hey, uh, you need to let people um, buy things outside of uh, the app and you can't tell people that like uh, this needs to be the cheapest place for it. But uh, Jacob, go ahead and tell our audience what Apple is, is doing to kind of skirt this fairly reasonable request that you should be able to like click a link in an app and go to a, a store somewhere else and buy something. Yeah, so <laughs> Apple is getting around the court order that mandates that uh, developers should be allowed to do this by putting in the terms and conditions for these external links that developers still have to pay Apple 27% of revenue generated from those links. A 3% discount, how generous. <laughs> yeah, so like even if Apple doesn't like process the payment, right? They, they, they do nothing in this, right? They are still going to say, Hey, if you want to redeem that purchase in the application, you got to pay. And that is, that is just wild to me. Yeah. Like the, the analogy I think about is like Apple treating the device as something that like you should feel so honored to be on for people and it's kind of like a venue like there's some really hot club um but then all but then the club is hot and popular because there's amazing djs or bands there and yet every time someone's like oh hey i think i'd be a great dj or band for that club and you're contributing to the reputation of it the owners are like okay great uh we're we're gonna pay you like three percent or whatever of the people who are coming in or let's be reasonable yeah. i guess to use the 30 percent thing we're gonna pay you 70 percent of of um what happens when you come in here and you're like oh, okay well what if we want to like sell some merch like outside the venue or whatever it's like well you have to pay us uh for that as well and these kind of things that just wouldn't happen in the real yeah, world I, and the analogy that's very easy to think of is like credit cards credit cards right. take like 1.5%, 2%, 3% of a transaction. And that seems pretty reasonable. Well, that's so where the number comes from, right? So like the, the 27% yeah. is to account for what's probably most payment processors terms anywhere from one to 3%, right? So like yeah. most payment processors, they're charging you just a, a small amount. I mean, it's still a lot, if we're being honest. Um, they, how they get away with it when it's, you know, 2024 and you don't pay to like send bits over the wire you know between right. you know like uh, you do pay uh, that's maybe an exaggeration someone would call me out on that but not that much um <laughs> so like really this was just the 27 versus 30 percent must have just been them wanting to avoid further lawsuits by saying that they're discriminating against external payment processors by making it so that it costs more. As long as it costs the same, I think they assume they won't get in trouble. Yeah. Yep. And then there was the Google lawsuit, which uh, I think a lot of people were surprised to see that Epic kind of won 
every one of these counts, but it was kind of a weird one because it was, it seemed to be specifically about all the shady things that Google was doing to try to hide what they were doing. Like there were all these, you know, mandates about like how they need to delete all their emails and how they were kind of like gloating about all the terrible things they were doing to developers. And it was like, in so many ways, similar to the Apple situation, but like completely disorganized. And it seems like the result of this might be some kind of like special exception for Fortnite and Epic where they don't have to pay uh, a, a huge transaction fee the same way like Spotify and some of these other apps don't need to. But it doesn't necessarily seem like it's going to have the same ripple effect uh, out of the box to a lot of other developers in the the Google app ecosystem. Yeah. Yep. Well, I mean, t- to be clear, I... Even in like uh, Fortnite's case, like if you bought V Bucks on PC, I want to say that you could still utilize them on your iPhone. You just couldn't purchase them there. That's, mm-hmm. and I think that's true. Um, so like, yeah, it, it it's just a crazy situation. Um, it 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 seems fairly obvious that's an unfair practice and it's it's a shame that they're getting so much pushback um so yeah i I think this is probably a nail in the coffin for for that particular lawsuit Uh, i saw that there were reports that supreme court had denied it i can't imagine the supreme court taking that case um so yeah that's that's all she wrote which is uh (laughs) pretty sad yeah for now um, let's talk a little bit about uh, some things coming up. Uh, just for funsies, let's make a couple predictions. Jacob, when do you think Unreal Engine 5.4 will drop? Which, of course, is what you would see right now if you were to download uh, the main GitHub branch of Unreal. When do you think that will actually get a, a release? That will be GDC. That's my... In GDC. March, yep. Yeah. That would be my guess. Makes sense. Q1, you, uh, mid to late Q1, I think it checks out. Yeah. So the two uh, major wow moments of GDC in 2023 were probably the uh, Electric Dream sample with the Rivian uh, driving through um, uh, this huge procedurally generated environment, and then also the live demonstration of MetaHuman Animator. Do you think they're going to top that? Do you think we're, we've got anything on the horizon that would be kind of in those ballpark? If I <laughs> were to guess what they would announce this year, Given the situation they're in, I would bet that they lean in as heavy as they can into AI focused use cases in order to bubble up their valuation. Um, given that they've expressed they're in financial trouble, they kind of need good press, probably. Mm. Um, so I would guess they would probably double down on some of the like deformation and. Um, like face capture, like motion capture. Um, yeah, I, I, I bet they just doubled down on a lot of that stuff this year uh, to make sure that they walk out of something like GDC looking like a company that is a leader in AI for you know media entertainment. That would be my guess. And to be clear, you can look in the engine and see what they're shipping. I just, I haven't. <laughs> maybe you have out yeah i hear you <laughs> um a couple things coming up in terms of events or yeah like i i have some idea i'm not gonna not gonna reveal any of my potential insider knowledge um oh by the way Fortnite. anything exciting with Fortnite that you've noticed the past uh, couple months i always like to do a quick little yeah uh, a little Fortnite uh, up, uh, update uh nothing big thus far i mean it, we kind of reached the end of the you know the the OG Fortnite era, and we're back to mm-hmm. well. Actually, what I should say is probably since we've spoken, they've revamped a lot about the game. There was a solid like month or two where everyone was kind of freaking out because it's, some of the gameplay started feeling more like a Call of Duty, where it was like you had attachments for guns, and and there was a little bit that kind of pushed it more towards War Zones, <laughs> if I'm being honest. <laughs> um, but I, I think most of that has blown over and people are pretty happy with it. I'm definitely pretty happy with it. I, I think it's been pretty fun uh, overall. So that's that's the Fortnite update. Cool. That sounds great. Yeah, my uh, kids and I have been having a lot of fun with Lego Fortnite. 
Um, but we we get frustrated that you can build these great little like rocket cars that fly around, but there's no steering wheel. There's no way to like really guide exactly where they're going to go. So you're kind of at the mercy of your rockets. So, you know, my one little request for Lego Fortnite right now would be allow you to have the little switches that activate things, but have them be kind of, um, within the, the range of the rockets that are nearby them. So in lieu of a steering wheel, I'd like to be able to the ability to like turn on rear thrusters and then turn on left yeah. thrusters and then turn on right thrusters and then have a little bit more control over that super cool kit of parts of movement. <laughs> yeah. You know, there, I will say um, in general, I've been seeing a lot more Unreal Engine games pop up in game stores and everything else. One game that I poked at a little bit um well, actually, two games recently that I, I played a little bit were both Unreal Engine, uh, uh, by, maybe by coincidence, or maybe I'm just attracted to the visual style, and I see a trailer, and I something subconscious tells me. Um, but the game Hell Let Loose is like a World War II, like multi, uh, or massive multiplayer game. I would say, does it look the best as an Unreal Engine game? Probably not. But it is very impressive that they built a massive multiplayer game in Unreal Engine. So good for those people. And I, I've played only a little bit of it, but I've heard from, from friends that it's an incredible game. Um, another one is The Finals, which I think is actually um, a major contender for like one of the best FPS games right now. And mm -hmm. that's another category that Unreal Engine historically, you know, like uh, uh, competitive first-person shooters, have not been in the wheelhouse of Unreal Engine. Uh, so very cool to see some some new categories popping up, seeing more games on the store made with Unreal. Like that hasn't always been the case. So I, I'm I'm excited to see more of that. Yeah, makes sense. Um, do you have any theories on places, just back in the prediction mode, of places we might see Unreal Fest this year? I heard a little bit of a rumor that maybe Unreal Fest USA um, might not be in New Orleans this year. That'd be a little bit sad. But even for like Unreal Fest Asia or Gold Coast or whatever, um, can you imagine anywhere else that would be a cool place to have Unreal Fest? Well, first of all, I, I just want to put out there that I full on protest the movement of <laughs> Unreal Fest from New Orleans because I genuinely look forward to Unreal Fest, at least in part, like let's say 30% in part because you go to New Orleans, you have amazing food all week. It's always a good time. The music, like, I don't want it to move. You know, I, I'm good with where it's at. I, you know, I, I do enough, uh, you know, convention centers and random cities, and most of them are just surrounded by total barren nonsense. And you just go from your hotel, the convention center, and back, and that's it. Uh, so I, I can't imagine. Now, if I had to choose somewhere for it to be relocated, I would obviously choose New York because New York's a great city. Um, or alternatively, yeah, somewhere nice and warm. Um, <laughs> like if you wanted to put this in Miami, wouldn't be that upset, to be honest. Sure. But I'd really like it to stay in New Orleans. That would be cool. I know a lot of you were also frustrated this past year because um, Unreal Fest was very, very close to was this 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 year or last year maybe it was last year or uh, and i by last year i mean 2022 but there was oh man my camera <laughs> there was apple vision oh my god i'm just glitching right now <laughs> uh, this <laughs> is a pretty was... common occurrence on this podcast for, for those who, who watch the youtube video is when alex yeah. turns into the, the little pulsating uh uh blob when his camera dies hilarious yeah. <laughs> we'll just let it happen no need to cut this out alex this, this is real behind the scenes stuff um i'm gonna try to kill my my vcam here um there was a year when autodesk university was happening very very close to unreal fest i think this was 2022 and then it was like two weeks later that unreal fest happened so it was like just enough time where like no one was really gonna stay um whereas you know there would have been something kind of interesting about actually being able to do both events. So I'm sure that would have been completely exhausting. Anytime I travel, I'm always looking for like, how can I bundle multiple things together to make it the most um, yeah. valuable trip possible? But man, I, I'm bummed that Unreal Fest would move. Now, in terms of Asia, um, that's a good question. I've heard that Gold Coast in Australia will happen again. 
cool. But maybe maybe we'll get something in Japan. That'd be pretty cool. That'd be a good excuse to go to Japan. But I, as a first trip, that might be uh, not quite as beneficial. <laughs> so they actually did Unreal Fest in Tokyo last year. Oh, did they? They did. It was um, May 22nd to May 28th. Oh, man. I missed out. Oh, the website's actually really cool. Hold on. Let me uh, let me just show this. There's something very like uh, Shinjuku about this whole thing. Um, load, load. There it is. Yeah. Look at this thing. Show overlay. Whoa, that's a cool one. It got like some cyberpunk <laughs> vibes to it. Yeah, right. That's pretty cool. I guess I uh, they didn't speak a whole lot of English there, so it probably wouldn't have been too productive for me. <laughs> yeah, but it looks amazing. I'm, well, I mean, they, they must have had international speakers, but maybe the whole thing was in Japanese. I don't Who know. Who knows? Um, but that's really cool. Yeah, that's, really, yeah. that's sweet. I mean, I, I did the Korea thing where, you know, I had a translator the whole time, and that was not as complicated or difficult as I thought. So yeah. by all means, if, if Epic or anyone else wants to send me to uh, Tokyo <laughs> oh, yeah, and, you'll and take it. a translator the whole time, <laughs> I will do it. I promise I'll do it. <laughs> uh, all right. Oh, man. So I guess let's wrap up with um, a few events coming yeah. up. Um, oh, and I'll mention briefly that the other day there was a very cool event at the Microsoft Garage in New York City uh, sponsored by Leia. Uh, who makes the Lume Pad, and they were showing some really beautiful Unreal Engine content on the Lume Pad. They were also advertising the fact that they are going to be at the MIT Reality Hack, and they have a new version of their Unreal Engine plugin coming soon. Lume Pad, by the way, is like a 3D screen. So again, like a frame, like a 3D TV that doesn't require glasses. Um, and they have a new version of their Unreal plugin coming that will let you see the live content in the editor that you are are doing live in your Unreal Engine editor in 3D, which is kind of cool. Um, Looking Glass also has a similar plugin, so it's a really cool way to develop live or just show people you know, stuff in the moment as you're messing around and changing things in kind of like a virtual production environment. So yeah, cool. MIT Reality Hack, of course, is also a really exciting place for people to get together. Sorry, Jacob, what were you going to say? No, no, I, I, was, uh, I was just backing, the, backing you up here. Yeah. Uh, Jacob, have you ever been to the MIT Reality Hack? Well, that's that's where Alex and I met, actually. Uh, that's right. <laughs> way back in the day. I haven't been uh, since since that first time. Um, but it was an amazing event. Uh, it was cut off. My, my you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, attendance was cut off by COVID. And I, I haven't made it part of my uh, scheduled rotation of conferences but it is an awesome event so i i do really recommend especially if you're just getting into to xr and you want a chance to learn a few things meet up with some people like amazing opportunity it's a shame that it's not happening a couple weeks later because they usually have really good uh partners and maybe i like i wonder if this will happen next year but it would have been amazing if apple actually uh, was there and had some Vision Pros available for people yeah. to hack with. Because one thing that makes the MIT Reality Hack very different from, say, like Global Game Jam is, um, yeah, the partner support. So you will often have, you know, Magic Leap and HoloLens and Vario and um, Tesla suits and like all these things that are are there from a hardware perspective, along with actual devs at the companies who are going to help you integrate uh, using their technology into their software. Um, the year Jacob and I were there, I think also had like, you know, representatives with uh, Microsoft and uh, Azure Connects and things like that. If you want to do something with volumetric data or uh, the motion capture data from there, um, you also get people like like Max from um, Normcore, who makes like a really cool Unreal Engine multiplayer plugin. So you get developers and hardware manufacturers and all these people who are there to help you over this, you know, weekend sprint uh, to make something really, really cool. So I think the amount that people learn over the MIT reality hack is like 700% what you could learn in that same amount of time by yourself. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's, it's an awesome event. Yeah. Did what, you make something in that? unreal engine? I'm trying to remember what you built that. Year. Oh no, no. I, I was an instructor that year. That's for, right. For yeah, that's right. That's and no one was using unreal. So I didn't do a whole lot. If I'm yes. Being you and uh, Steve uh, Bauer had the same problem. Yeah. You were both unreal yeah. engine instructors and then there was like not enough people. Um, to actually help out. <laughs> and I would, yeah, Steve Bowler. And um, I was actually trying to get my team to use Unreal Engine. And they were like, ah, we just feel more comfortable in Unity. So I ended up in Unity that year. But yeah. alas. Damn, Unity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, just to wrap up, uh, MIT Reality Hack coming out soon. Hope people go check that out. 
And then um, I think that's it on my list. I don't know if there's anything else major coming up. So uh, thank you, everyone. Welcome back to 2024. Jake and I are happy to uh, be here with you all and, and see all the cool things that are going to happen this year with devices and hardware and software and games and Unreal Engine. And we look forward to chatting again soon. Yeah. See you another time. See you next time. Cheers. <laughs>